The following story is told from the point of view of a female. I married my husband exactly one week after my 19th birthday. Marcus was, as my stepfather Jedediah Bell had repeatedly told me, a good match for me. He was a member of the same congregation that my stepfather was a pastor of. His most defining qualities were that he was near my age. Jedediah made it very clear that, as the head of the household, he was perfectly capable of finding me a God-fearing husband. My stepfather had married my widowed mother when I was 14. He came into our life like a showman. Jedediah was larger than life in almost every way. Large stomach, large smile, and large beliefs about how wives and stepdaughters should treat the new man of the house. Please, Greta, just make sure you do as he says. He means everything to me. My mother pleaded with me. The pain and desperation in her face was enough to convince me. Just to see her happy again was enough. At least, it had been. I hadn't interacted much with Marcus before our fast engagement and hasty church wedding on a sweltering day in May. He was always in khakis or faded blue jeans, complete with a button-down shirt every Sunday morning, sandwiched between his parents and siblings. I had known that he was a mechanic, and the smell of machine oil always lingered around him. He never smiled. His eyes had always seemed cold to me despite the warm shade of blue they contained. Shortly after we were married, he took a job as a mechanic at a shop that was about an hour away from where we were currently living which was in my old bedroom, while we looked for a home. I was actually happy to be leaving my stepfather and mother behind. I loved my mother, but she had become a timid and quiet thing, not like the mother I remembered from when my father was still alive. As Jedediah would say, with his wide smile, A wife has to do what's best for her husband, which means obeying without question. My own job was simple. I was a receptionist at a dentist office, but I loved it there. I had no other education besides my high school diploma, and I started my job right after school. My co-workers were so kind, I cried as I turned in my two weeks notice. They gave me a small farewell party, complete with cake and wine, and told me to keep in touch. The move was fast since I had very little to move into our new home. I could fit all of my clothes in a small and battered suitcase that was older than I was. The rest of my possessions fit into a cardboard box. I loaded up my car with my things and set out for what I hoped would be a bright future. I stopped only once to gather groceries, as I knew it would be up to me to make lunch and dinner that night. The home that we were renting was an old one. When my eyes first laid on it, my heart sank. I could already envision the old Formica counters and threadbare carpets. The house looked like it was barely holding itself together. Marcus was silent with me as we moved in our things, though he did make conversation with his brothers and relatives who came to haul in the heavier furniture. I busied myself with unpacking the kitchen as quickly as I could, so I could start making lunch for everyone. I approached Marcus as he was carrying a box into the master bedroom. What would you like to eat for lunch, sweetheart? That term of endearment sounded so false on my tongue, I nearly choked. He was my husband, not my sweetheart. Marcus paused long enough to give me a harsh glare. I withered under that gaze and looked down. Just make some fried chicken. You're good at that. And some mashed potatoes, he said gruffly as he turned away to store the box in the bedroom. I made haste to make the fried chicken and mashed potatoes. I was thankful that I had stopped at the grocery store to gather supplies. Fried chicken would be easy to make. Lunch was ready just as the last cardboard box found its way into the house. I served everyone at the table while Marcus led us in prayer. My stepfather and mother were not present, as my stepfather did not like to travel and my mother was rarely able to go anywhere without her husband. It was up to Marcus to say the blessings before we could begin to eat our meal. I also had misjudged how hungry everyone would be. The men devoured the chicken as fast as I set it on the table. By the time I was able to sit down and join everyone, there was only one small piece left. One of Marcus's brothers saw that I had nothing left for myself and insisted that I should take the last piece of meat. I ate it happily, though I saw Marcus glaring at me out of the corner of my eye, and I wondered with a jolt of fear what I had done wrong. After everyone had left, I found out why Marcus had glared at me. 
While I was cleaning up the table, he grabbed my forearm roughly and squeezed it hard, digging in his nails which were crusted with dirt. I whimpered slightly but stopped myself from jerking away as I knew it would only make it worse. He looked into my eyes and spoke in a low and angry voice. Why didn't you make sure that you had enough food for everyone? You humiliated me. My brother shouldn't have to give up food so you can stuff yourself. You did nothing all day while we worked. I stuttered, biting back a retort, realizing that it wouldn't do any good. I I'm sorry, Marcus. This Sunday I'll make everyone lunch, and I can make enough for everyone to make up for today. I grimaced as his grip on my arm increased. I was sure that his dirty nails were now breaking the skin. With one last hard squeeze he let me go and sat back in his chair. I think that'll make up for it, but you better be sure to ask proper forgiveness for my brother and everyone else that helped out today. I nodded numbly, not yet daring to move away from him. He gave me one more last withering glare and set off to the garage, most likely to arrange his tools in the small space. After he was out of sight, I gingerly rubbed my forearm. A nasty bruise was already starting to form. There were little half-moon marks where his nails had dug into my arm. I wasn't sure how to hide my bruises, as I had a job interview the next day. It was for another receptionist job. It would not be much, but it would grant me at least some autonomy away from my husband. I wrapped my arm in a dish towel that I dipped in cold water. After that, I took extra care to wash the dishes and make sure the kitchen was as clean as possible. I winced when I heard Marcus come in from the garage a few hours later. I was still straightening up the bedroom and putting clothes away when he came to bed. He didn't say anything to me or even look at me. He turned on the bedroom TV and watched the local television until he fell asleep. It was only after he had fallen asleep that I felt safe enough to lie down next to him. I stayed there and waited for sleep to take me. The interview the next morning went incredibly well. I opted to wear a long sleeve silk blouse to cover up my bruised arm. I was hired on the spot, as they had been desperate for a new receptionist with previous experience. Plus I had nothing but glowing reviews from my previous job. I was excited. This job would give me time away from home and my own money, plus benefits. I went home after the interview feeling optimistic. I would have called and told Marcus and my mother about my new job but I didn't have a cell phone. My husband would hear about the job once he got home that night. For dinner, I made meatloaf and arranged the table as nicely as possible. There was still a knot of fear on my stomach as I laid out the food for our meal. If something is not to Marcus's satisfaction, I didn't want to risk getting another bruise. He arrived just as I set the meatloaf on the table. I looked up at him as he entered. He didn't look at me, but headed straight to the kitchen to wash his hands. After the blessing, we ate in silence. He devoured his food, and even went for seconds. I took the opportunity to try and start a conversation. How was your job today? I asked, trying to keep my tone light and pleasant. I was rewarded with a glare. I don't want to talk while I'm eating. He said as he swallowed another bite. I nodded and looked down not wanting to do anything else to provoke him. After dinner, he went into the garage and stayed there until bedtime, never even bothering to say a single word to me. I preferred it that way. I finally told him that I had gotten the job. He rolled over and gave me what probably amounted to a pleased look. It's good that you got a job. Just to make sure you're depositing everything in a joint account. As the man of the house, I'll make sure you have an allowance to cover gas. And with that... He rolled over and went to sleep. I said nothing, but I let a few silent tears roll down my cheek in the dark. Any autonomy I had hoped for would be gone now. I should just run away. I could pack everything on my truck and just drive as far as I could. But how far would I get with no money? My truck needed gas, and I would need food. There was no friends I could turn to, and my own mother was out of the question. I was alone. The next day was a Saturday, and Marcus was off work. Marcus pinched me awake at dawn to go make breakfast. I rushed to make it. Anything to get away from those bruising pinches. Since it was a Saturday, 
I knew he might work on his own truck today or mow the lawn. It would give me time to myself and I could decorate the inside of the house. While I was making a list of groceries to get while I was out later that day, I saw Marcus coming from our room with a handful of my clothes. Marcus, what are you doing with my clothes? He stopped and looked at me, staring me down with those cold eyes. These t-shirts aren't decent. You should only be wearing long-sleeved shirts or dresses. He held up the few t-shirts I actually owned. Some of them were plain cotton tees. The others were nice ones that I wore to work when it was hot. I'm going to turn these into rags. I could use some for my garage. He glared at me again, almost daring me to fight him. I shrunk back from his gaze. But if you take those shirts, I won't have much to wear for work. I'll have to go buy some long-sleeved tops somewhere. I said pleadingly. I hated myself in that moment. I should have slapped him, taken my things and run away. Money and marriage be damned. Sleeping on the street would be better than this. But I didn't move. I stayed glued to the spot, staring at the floor because I was too afraid to make eye contact with the man that I had married. Marcus sighed and threw my clothes to the ground, pulled out his wallet and handed me a creased $20 bill. I took it with trembling fingers. There's probably a good will somewhere in this town. You can go get yourself some clothes and make sure you bring me back my change. I nodded and stuffed the bill into my purse while he took my clothes to the garage. I left as soon as the door closed behind him, grabbing the grocery list as I went. I didn't want to be around him while he destroyed my things. Once I was on the road, I started crying. I wiped my face angrily. Tears weren't going to be doing me any good. Instead, I set out to try to find a Goodwill or some kind of thrift shop. It turned out my new town had none of these things and I was starting to give up hope of finding any cheap clothing. I would have to settle for the local Target and hoped they had a sale going on. As I was thinking this, I saw on the side of the road a small yellow sign proudly proclaiming Yard Sale, 505 Turner Street. Someone had even tied a pink balloon on it to attract attention. I smiled. I had forgotten all about yard sales. It was a warm Saturday and there would probably be a ton of them. I might be able to even find some clothes. I turned into the side street and it didn't take me long to find the yard sale. There were eight cars lined up on the side of the road. At least a dozen people were examining tables filled with secondhand goods. It had been one of the bigger yard sales I had seen. It looked like they were clearing out the entire house. I spotted what I had been hoping to find. Clothes were carefully arranged on a pole suspended between two trees. I parked my truck and walked over, happy to see that some of the clothes were women's clothing. I browsed to the shirts and pants. I could tell that they had belonged to an older woman, but they were in great shape and some of them even had tags on them. I settled on five new tops. They were all long-sleeved and looked conservative enough for both my work and my husband's tastes. I tucked my finds under my arm and fished out the $20 Marcus had given me. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed a box that had been placed under the clothes titled Miscellaneous, with a tiny doll poking out of it. It was entirely nondescript and devoid of any features. It was like a rag doll. It had tiny red stitches for eyes and a mouth. The fabric looked like some kind of faded linen. I squished its belly hoping to find out what it was stuffed with. Whatever its insides were composed of rolled around. Maybe it was filled with dried beans? The tiny doll looked at me in what I thought was an expression of curiosity, which is not possible, as it hardly had any features at all. In some ways, it reminded me of Oogie Boogie from one of my favorite childhood films. I held on to the tiny doll. It wouldn't hurt to ask how much it was. The woman who was running the yard sale was sitting at a small table under a shade of a large tree. She was dressed in a sleeveless bright pink top with white shorts, all of which complemented her dark skin. She looked up at me and smiled warmly and gestured to what I was holding. Is that going to be all for you, honey? She asked with a pleasant voice. I nodded and laid down the shirts on the table so she could count them. 
Well, it's going to be 10 bucks for the shirts, honey. Do you need a bag to carry them? Uh, yes, thank you, I answered. I then held up the doll for her to see. How much would you like for this little doll? She reached for it and I let her take it. She gave it a small squeeze and let out a tiny laugh. Oh, I remember this little thing. My mom bought it when we took a trip down to New Orleans. Oh, about mm, 20 years ago. She always wanted a authentic voodoo doll. I looked at the doll in surprise. So this little doll is really a voodoo doll? I had never seen one in real life before. If Marcus found out that I had even touched it, he would be upset. She set it down with the clothes and gave it a thoughtful look. Oh yes, my mom was adamant that she wanted a real one. She didn't want any of those fake tourist souvenirs. It was the last trip we all took together as a family. It wasn't long afterwards that my father passed away from a heart attack. She sighed and made a sweeping motion with her hands to encompass the yard sale. All of this is because my mom died last month. It's up to me to make sure everything gets sold off. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I trailed off suddenly. Not sure what else to say. Anything that anyone could say about the death of a loved one seemed hollow. She shook her head. Oh, it's alright, sweetie. Death is just a natural part of living, after all. She poked at the doll one more time. I'll sell it to you for a dollar. I thought for a moment. I would get in trouble if my husband found that doll. Of course, he might not even know what it is if he found it. Buying it would be a risk. An act of defiance. I think that sounds just fine. I handed over the money, and she handed me back the change and stuffed everything in a bag for me. I left the yard sale feeling accomplished. I had gotten a good deal, even better than shopping at a goodwill. I would have bought more, but I was expected to be back in time to make lunch. I dug around in the bag and set my little doll on the dashboard. It was almost like having a friend along for the ride. Once I finished the rest of my errands, I drove home, making sure to stuff the doll in my purse. I didn't want Marcus to know that I had it. While I was putting the groceries away, Marcus came in from the garage. I noticed with a stab of anger he was wiping his greasy hands on one of my old shirts. Give me the change and show me what you bought. If it's not appropriate, I'm going to turn it into rags like I did the others. I pulled out the change from my billfold, to which he stuffed into his wallet while he waited for me to show him what I had bought. Each shirt was laid out on the table for his inspection. I was certain that they would be alright, but I was still nervous. These are okay. You don't need to be showing any kind of skin anyway. Where did you buy them? He asked, finally looking at me. A yard sale. I figured that they would be cheaper. I answered, daring to meet his eyes. Good. This should be enough for you for now. I don't want any wife of mine spending money on clothes that she don't need. Now go make some lunch. I'm hungry. And with that, he turned around and walked back into the garage. Gathering up the shirts, I placed them neatly in my closet. My wardrobe was looking very sparse. As for the doll, I stuffed him under my pillow. I knew I was risking Marcus finding it, but for some reason I was comforted by its presence, and I wanted it close. A few weeks passed in a kind of blur. The only good thing was my new job. I was really enjoying it. I was getting along really well with all my co-workers, but at home things were getting progressively worse. What had started out with pinches and grabs was evolving into punches. The first time when he hit my face was when I asked him if I could have a cell phone. The force of the hit flung my head back, and I hit the wall, and started to cry. While I was slumped against the wall, he punched me in the back, driving the breath from my body. I fell to the floor and stayed there until Marcus went out into the garage. My face, though swollen, didn't bruise, so I didn't have to make up any excuses for my co-workers. The weekly gas allowance that Marcus had promised me was only $5 a week. I had nothing from which to save, which made the idea of running away even harder. I was not allowed to buy my own lunch or go anywhere after work, even though several co-workers had invited me out. My only relief at home was my tiny doll. Once Marcus was done with his abuse, I would hug it to my chest and cry. It was the only thing in the house that was truly mine. I thought of my father and how I missed him so much. 
I also thought about how much I wished that he was the one who lived and my mother died. I would have never been forced to marry Marcus. He would have never let Jedediah into our lives. As months wore on, I thought I was starting to go crazy. Perhaps the isolation and abuse were starting to screw with my brain. Every time I looked at the doll, it looked a little bit more like Marcus every day. Its tiny stitches and mouth, so devoid of expression, now seemed to remind me of my husband's glare and perpetual scowl. It was on a Sunday in September that I received the worst beating I had gotten so far. I had really been tired that morning, and while Marcus had gone to meet some friends from our old town, I laid down to take a nap. I had been sleeping peacefully on the bed, when suddenly, I was thrown to the floor. I screamed as I opened my eyes and saw Marcus staring down at me. Why are you sleeping on a Saturday? Don't you have eyes to see that the house is a mess? What kind of wife can't even clean properly? He lifted his boot and brought it down hard on my stomach. My breath left me painfully. I had no time to recover before he pulled his leg back and kicked me in the ribs. Once, twice, then three times. I was screaming and begging for him to stop. And all it got me was a slap to the face. He knelt down beside me and held me by the hair, forcing me to look him in his eyes. If this house isn't clean and lunch isn't on the table by the time I get back from the hardware store, I'll do even worse to you. Do you understand? Yes, Marcus. I, I understand. I stammered, holding his gaze until he let go of my hair, and my head hit the carpet with a thump. I stayed on the ground until I heard the door slam behind him. I felt my stomach and my ribs. Was anything broken or bruised? I couldn't tell. It hurt so bad. I couldn't sit up, but I made myself crawl to the bathroom. When I was able to stand, I swallowed some aspirin and stared at myself in the mirror. My right cheek was starting to swell and bruise. There would be no way to hide these marks from my co-workers on Monday. My stomach burned as I went back into the bedroom. I took out my doll and sobbed into its fabric. Now more than ever it reminded me of Marcus. His evil glare and twisted mouth were there, plainly on the doll's face. I felt a surge of anger and hatred for him. I had never in my life wanted anyone or anything to die as much as I wanted Marcus to die at that moment. From under the bed I took my sewing box and grabbed the largest needle I could find. With one last look at the doll, I stabbed the needle right through its left eye, piercing it completely. The doll fell to the ground and I left it there. I couldn't find the energy to pick it up. My mind was made up. I would call my old office and see if anyone would let me stay with them for a while. They had always been so kind to me. Surely one of them would help me. I mentally chastised myself for not thinking of it earlier. Instead of cleaning like Marcus had wanted, I started packing my suitcase. I readied Marcus's bedside table for a loose change and came up with a few crumpled bills. It would give me enough gas to drive away. I made a place for my doll on top of my clothes and I pulled out the sewing needle feeling guilty for stabbing it in the eye. Oddly enough, it looked like its old self again. All traces of Marcus's scowl were gone. There was a knock at the door, and my heart jumped into my throat. It was Marcus, back to make good on his promise. But it couldn't be Marcus. If it was him, he would have just opened the door and walked in. To be safe though, I hid my suitcase in my closet, and I ran to answer the door. It was not Marcus, but it was two police officers staring at me through the screen door. My heart was pounding. Opening the door, I forced a smile. Hello officers, can I help you? The male police officer took off his hat and gave me a sorrowful look. His partner, a woman, took one look at my bruised and swollen face and gave me a very knowing look. Ma'am, I'm sorry to tell you this, but your husband has been in an accident. The next few days were all a continual blur. As I made the arrangements for my husband's funeral, Marcus died while driving his truck. The doctors told me after his autopsy that he had suffered from a massive brain aneurysm that killed him instantly. His car had rolled off into a ditch. The force of the impact had tossed his body through the windshield. The ambulance arrived in minutes, but there was nothing they could have done. 
His parents and siblings were beyond consolation. My heart went out to them. Marcus might have been their kin, but they shared none of his temperaments. They were nothing but kind to me, and I couldn't help but feel guilty for causing them any pain. At the funeral, I wore a new black dress with short sleeves, not caring whether anyone saw the bruises on my arm that had been Marcus's final parting gift. Jedediah took issue with it, though. He looked indifferently over my bruised arms. These things can happen in a marriage. He was a good husband to you, Greta. At least cover yourself up so no one can talk ill of the dead. With the funeral over, I had freedom for the first time in my life. It was a liberating feeling to have my own place and my own money, and I could do what I pleased. I took perhaps too much pleasure in donating Marcus's possessions, but I felt completely purged when the last reminder of him was finally gone from the house. The only problem now was my mother and Jedediah, who were pressuring me to come back and live with them, despite my assurances that I was doing okay and I was getting by with just my paycheck. My stepfather would call me on my new cell phone and lecture me about how an unmarried woman's place was at home, and he would talk about how much my mother missed me. His voice was sickeningly condescending as he talked to me like a child. I listened politely while he told this piece over the phone, all the while holding my doll to my chest. And you know what? It was starting to look a lot like Jedediah. I'm a psychiatrist, in training at least. I am completing my residency to be 100% truthful, but I'm almost there. The stories I have heard within these walls could fill a book, but there is one particular case that has caused me to lose sleep. This story has plagued my mind for far too long. Typing this out is my feeble attempt to make sense of something my rational mind refuses to comprehend. As stated above, I meet some fascinating characters where I work. For example, one patient will rant endlessly about how a demon named Ock won't stop using his prehensile penis to impregnate her ears with fire ants. But that is a story for another time. I did my rounds a few months ago with my attending doctor and came across a new patient on my caseload. She seemed lovely. Too lovely, in fact. Not much seemed to be wrong with her. She greeted me with warm and accepting eyes upon our first meeting. What I saw before me was a demure woman in her late thirties. Tamiz Tifiet was her name. She was a Haitian immigrant relatively new to the good old US of A. I entered her room expecting to be greeted by a raving paranoid mess, but I was instead introduced to one of the nicest, most refreshingly kind people you could ever hope to meet at a psychiatric hospital. We are a progressive facility and allow our patients to personalize their rooms as they see fit. I surveyed her room hoping that something would call out to me and indicate I had a hopelessly schizophrenic person before me to match the chart and information I had been given. But alas, this was not the case. All I saw was a line of dolls on the shelf. I was informed that Tamise had stitched them herself. I marveled at the intricacies of each doll. The attention to detail was sublime on these figures. I immediately began to admire this woman. However, I was reminded that I was here for a reason. We began to talk. I inquired as to how she was doing. She replied she was right as rain. There was such a serenity to her demeanor that it was infectious. However, I knew why she was there and began to focus my questioning in that direction. So, I asked, can you tell me about your relationship with your neighbor? He mean all evil man, that rotten scowl on his face. He knew what he done. She paused. But he's smiling now, child. He's smiling now, she said while serenely pointing to the dolls on her shelf. At the time, I did not get what she was trying to indicate. I went home that night and slept peacefully for what may be the last time in my life. 
Lo and behold, Tamiz showed up on my schedule the next day, something I was happy to note. The mystery of this woman plagued me. I couldn't wait to unfurl her mind and discover what caused her to do what she did. You see, three months prior to our first meeting, she confronted her neighbour with a knife. She claimed that he was breaking into her apartment and moving things around in an attempt to frighten her into leaving. The most bizarre accusation she had levied against him was that he had tunnelled a hole into her apartment at night and raped her. This all had the makings of the paranoid delusions of a schizophrenic. In any case, she stabbed him in the chest. Luckily for him, he escaped the building and the wound was not fatal. At the hearing, Mr. Calvin Cadwell testified to all of this via Skype from his hospital bed. He remarked about her strange and demonic religious practices. He shouted that she was a violent psycho and a delusional nutjob. No one spoke up in Tamiza's defence, her state-appointed attorney clearly incompetent. He didn't even allow Tamiz to testify on her own behalf. The prosecution stated that this crazed foreigner was a menace, dangerous and absolutely unapologetic for her crimes. In a reversal of the usual course of things, Cadwell's testimony and the prosecution's evidence were so effective as to proving her insanity that she was deemed not fit to stand trial at the time. As I sat in her room, Anticipation coursed through me as I prepared to delve into this woman's mind. So, Tamiz, can you tell me more about the incident with your neighbour? She seized up for a moment. Then the smile reappeared on her face, lending her the warm countenance I had grown so fond of. Not much to say. He knew what he did. He was a mean old man. Never smiled once in his miserable life but he's smiling now. She stood up from her bed and slowly walked toward her shelf of dolls. She picked up one in particular and handed it to me. I looked at the poppet in my hands. It was much more plain than the other dolls. In the belly of the figure was a pin. Connected to the pin was a red yarn. The yarn was pulled upward and created a smile below its two beady eyes. You'll see soon enough. He's smiling. He's smiling. Any further inquiries into the altercation with a neighbour were rebuffed. I wandered the hospital for the remainder of the day with a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach. Tamiz was odd, no doubt, but she seemed way too nice to attempt to kill a man unprovoked. I re-evaluated her file in an attempt to wrap my mind around the case. However, her claims read too much like a persecution complex born from a psychotic break. Even the nicest people can lose touch with reality and act out with a violence that is completely out of character. Still, something about this just didn't sit right. If any of this were true, or even if she just believed it to be true, why hadn't she gone to the police? There were two answers to this. Immigrants, especially those not necessarily here in the States legally, are reluctant to turn to the authorities for almost any matter. The second option was that she had just fabricated the entire thing in her mind, and a delusional paranoid would be highly unlikely to seek out the help of the police department. I was leaning heavily toward the latter explanation. However, that feeling of unease latched on and remained with me for the rest of that evening. I opened my eyes and looked at the clock. It was 2.34. I'm a deeper sleeper and rarely get up in the middle of the night. What could have awoken me? Soon, I received an answer. Loud scratching noises were filling the void of the silence in my bedroom. I brushed it off initially, but the noise persisted. As a matter of fact, it only grew in volume and proximity. My heart began to race. What the fuck is making that sound? The fact that my room was pitch black was not helping matters. I slowly got out of bed and turned on the lamp on my nightstand. The second the light illuminated the darkness, a crashing sound filled the air. This noise was so loud that I literally jumped into the air. The anxiety already coursing through me reached a fever pitch when I realised the source of the sound. It was coming. From my closet. I unplugged the lamp, the only thing I could think of to defend myself, and carried it in my hands. I slowly inched my way toward the closed closet door. I opened it. 
blackness greeted me. With my free hand, I pulled at the string to turn on the closet light. Nothing in the world could prepare me for what lay within. I dropped the lamp as it shattered into a hundred pieces. Standing in my closet was the doll with the red smile, no longer merely inches big, but life-size. Frozen in place, I stared at its face. Its beady, lifeless eyes stared right back. I looked at its stomach as the silver pin gleamed in the light of the closet. Behind the doll, I could see what looked like a crude tunnel excavated from the apartment next door. My mind reeled. As the doll began to walk towards me, its hand stretched out. The crimson smile grew larger. I kept backing up and eventually fell onto my bed. The doll continued to follow suit. A hand clasped onto my shoulder. I turned to see Tamizas' face crouched next to my bed. Now you see what he done. No matter. He's smiling now. He's smiling. I awoke to my alarm. Panic seized me. Within moments, I was able to gather my thoughts. It was just a dream. It was just a dream. I tried to tell myself this over and over again on the way to the hospital, but I knew better. There was something so wholly visceral and lucid about the experience. It can't just have been a dream. Plus, there was one undeniable fact that my rational mind could not refute. It was the wound on my foot I received that morning from stepping on my broken lamp. When I arrived at work, I saw that I would once again be meeting with Tamiz that morning. Instead of being excited about this encounter, dread filled me. I felt nauseous. I stilled myself and made my way to her room. I opened her door and was greeted with a smile more bright and beaming than usual. Before a word could escape from my nervous lips, she spoke. How did you sleep last night, child? She said with a wink. As unprofessional and cowardly as this is, I ran. You'll see, you'll see, smiling. Timise called out to me as I rushed down the hallway. I got into my car and began to drive. I called the hospital to inform them that I was violently ill and would not be coming back that day. With my mind in tatters, I parked my car and mulled over a course of action. Eventually, I collected myself. I knew what I had to do. I had memorized Tamiza's address from her file. I was going to confront this smiling neighbor of hers and get to the bottom of this thing. I arrived at her building and buzzed the super. I was greeted by a surly man in his late fifties. What do you want? He said from the doorway of his apartment. Sir, if I could just have a moment of your time. I am one of the psychiatrists of Tamiz Tifiet, and I had a few questions. That crazy voodoo bitch. I'm glad they locked her up. Not my problem anymore. Good riddance, he said abruptly. I was just wondering if you had any insight into her dispute with her neighbor, Mr... I drew a blank on his name. Cadwell. And I wish they would lock up that fucking piece of shit too. But I guess being an insufferable asshole isn't a crime. The super seemed to open up slightly, finding joy in trash talking the tenant. He's such a miserable fuck sitting up there all by himself. So fucking rude to everyone he runs into with that fucking scowl on his face. Well, that's what you get when you never marry or have kids. Though I couldn't imagine anybody standing more than two seconds with a guy. I have no idea why he wants to expand his apartment into two units. What use could he possibly have for all of that space? Well, now that she's gone, the board is probably going to approve. Pardon, I called out as my eyebrows raised. Yeah, that's what they were fighting about. He wanted her unit, and she wouldn't leave. Wouldn't leave the bitch alone about it. I was flabbergasted. Ah, uh, don't you think it would have been pertinent to tell the police this? She's sitting in a psychiatric hospital right now because his harassment of her was thought to be a delusion. Well, no one asked me. And to be frank, that's where she belongs. That voodoo shit she's up to is insane and fucking godless, he said dismissively. Listen, in our sessions, she claims that Mr. Cadwell was tunneling into her apartment. Is there any truth to that? In light of what you've just told me, that doesn't seem so far-fetched. 
Well, this is the first I'm hearing about that specifically. She never told me about anything of that sort. I couldn't stand that woman with her fucking voodoo nonsense and those freaky ass dolls and she knew it. We weren't particularly close, if you catch my drift. I was really starting to despise this man, but I pressed on. There were no witnesses. The case entirely rests on Cowdwell's testimony. What if he really did rape her? What if their altercation wasn't so clear-cut? I could see a case being made for self-defense if he really harassed and assaulted her. The super stared back at me blankly. Well, don't you think it's worth looking into? I asked, with rage beginning to build in my voice from talking to this jerk. He caught a hint of it, and his face turned sour. Again, not my fucking problem. He slammed the door to his unit in my face. I contemplated leaving the apartment building and returning to the hospital to inform my superiors about what I had discovered. However, my feet wouldn't move to the exit. I recalled what I had seen when searching the buzzer for the superintendent. Cadwell, 2C. Without fully comprehending what I was doing or the lengths I was willing to go to find answers, I ascended the stairs. As I came upon the door, I took a deep breath and knocked. No answer. I continued to knock and pressed my ear against the door. I waited. Nothing was stirring inside. Figuring the type of man Mr. Cadwell was, Trying to turn his doorknob would be fruitless as he would have six deadbolts locked on the other side. However, I gave it a shot. To my surprise, the knob turned, providing me entrance into the apartment. I slowly crept into his dark, dingy abode. I quickly surveyed my surroundings. This place was disgusting. Empty pizza boxes and filth lined the floor of the entryway. The living room looked no different. Trash and piles of dishes lined the ancient coffee table. As I moved toward the kitchen, the smell finally reached my nose. It was a pungent stench. Something was rotting. I mused that it would in no way be surprising if a dead animal lay somewhere in the offal of this filthy place. Jesus, how can this guy live like this, I thought. I made my way to what must be the bedroom. The door was closed. I made a mental note that this room had to be adjacent to Tamiza's apartment. I knocked on the door. Again, no answer. I gathered my courage and turned the knob. The door swung open. Immediately, the smell made me wretch. It was an aroma that lay thick in the air and assaulted my nostrils. My first instinct was to run, but I was so close to finding the truth. I just had to know. I had to. I felt preternaturally drawn forward. I placed my shirt over my nose and mouth as I looked around the room. On the wall, shared with Tamiza's apartment, stood a dresser. It was askew, pointing at a 45 degree angle. I circled around and saw what I had hoped to find. A small dark hole lay in front of me. As the smell continued to overwhelm me, I got on my knees and pulled out my cell phone to use as a flashlight. How I wish I had just left well enough alone that my curiosity hadn't got the better of me. As I shined the light into the hole in the wall, pure, unadulterated terror washed over me. What I saw there will haunt me for the rest of my life. Mr. Cadwell sat there in Tamiza's closet. He was facing my direction, his beady, dead eyes boring a hole into me. A knife was plunged into his stomach. Through the gaping hole in his gut, Cadwell had yanked out his intestines. Grasping them with both hands, he had pulled his innards across his mouth, stretching them upwards to what could only resemble one thing. A red, beaming smile. There's always a reason to be afraid.